It's great and it's a great honor to be here, and uh, I'm going to share with you um, a brief personal journey in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, it'll start with actually a journey we're going to date back 540 million years ago. Uh, what was life like 540 million years ago? Well, it was pretty simple. Most animals live in the waters, and they're very simple things like trilobites. They just float around. When the food comes by, they take a bite, but they don't do much. It's a little bit like August in Europe. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Actually, I, my husband is Italian, so I'm very fond of Europeans. So, um, but something really remarkable happened about 540 to 530 years ago, and that's what zoologists and evolutionary biologists call it the period of Cambrian explosion. What happened is that in a very, very short period of time by um, evolution scale, the number of species in the world, mostly in the water, just exploded. And it's very hard to explain this phenomenon. Um, a lot of scientists have studied fossil uh, evidence, climate, and, and all this, and, and, and try to put together a theory of what happened, what induced this remarkable explosion of species that people now call it evolution's big bang. A few years ago, a young Australian zoologist called Andrew Parker uh, put forward one of the most probably um, authoritative account for what happened. In a, sh in, in a nutshell, what happened is that eyes happened. Animals developed eyes. In his own words, the Cambrian explosion is triggered by the sudden evolution of vision, which set off an evolutionary arms race where animals either evolved or died. So with the onset of eyes, animals had to learn to um, uh, become proactive. They, uh, they become predators to seek out food, and some of them became predators to hide from the editor of pred predators, and because of that, um, the, 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 the variations in animal kingdom just exploded. Well, that was the beginning of vision. Let's just fast forward a little bit, 540 million years later. As far as we know, the most remarkable visual system in the universe is the human vision system. We open our eyes and we just understand this world and use vision to do so many things. So how do we define or how do we describe how well the human vision system is and what does the human vision system do? A few years ago, well actually 10 years ago, I was still a graduate student at Caltech and my advisors and I did the following experiment to try to um, to try to tab into more quantitatively and qualitatively what the human vision system is capable of doing. Imagine you were my subject. I would uh, sit you in front of a gray screen of, um, uh, of a computer, and then you will be asked to look into the center of the screen. And then when you're ready, you can hit a space bar to say, ready. Uh, what you will see in the following slide is a real world photo will flash uh, on the screen and it will be quickly, quickly taken away. Uh, in order to take away the residual imagery in your eyes, in your retina, it will be washed by a wallpaper like screen. And then once you see that real world photo, I pay you uh, $10 per hour and you have to type everything you've seen. Of course, I'm not paying you this morning, so you don't have to do that. But, but at least I want you to experience how, uh, what these photos look like one after the other. Here you go. 
so ignore the wallpaper looking thing, but you see the real world photo, right? They flashed extremely fast. So it's not like you can scrutinize the details, but remarkably, you can see quite a bit of the content. Um, what's really remarkable of every one of your visual system is that these photos are on the screen for a very short period of time. The shortest amount of uh, time it's on is about 27 milliseconds. 27 milliseconds is a little more than 1 40th of a second. And the longest photo that's on the screen is about 500 milliseconds. That's half of a second, literally a split of a second. Yet, your human visual system is still capable of understanding the content of the real world. And here is one result of a particular um, a particular picture in our actual experiment. Uh, here's the photo, and uh, in 40 milliseconds, people can describe a rough scenery, but five, by 500 milliseconds, it's like eternity. People can write novels about it, and I'm sure if we pay more, they'll write longer. Um, so, so this is how remarkable our, of our human visual system. After 540 million years of evolution, intelligent animals like us use vision to survive, to navigate, to work, to entertain, to communicate, and it's be it has become the most important uh, piece of our intelligence. In fact, our brain in, uh, in, uh, under our skull uh, spends about half of its neuronal process in visual processing. It's the most important sensory, perceptual, and cognitive system in our brain. So now, what do we want to do to in the in the flip side in the computer world? Well, really, we are tackling one of the key aspects of intelligence, which is visual intelligence. And what we really want to do is to enable, build machines, build computers that can can act with this kind of visual intelligence that humans are capable of. And that would be the collective dream of the field of computer vision, which is a big area within the field of artificial intelligence. So, well, there are many aspects of vision, and I'm not going to be able to articulate or share with you all of them. But there's one goal I would like to um, I would like to get into a little more details today and share with you the journey, the field, as well as myself have taken towards this one goal, one holy grail of computer vision. We already saw that in human vision, and that holy grail is total seeing understanding. What you've seen humans did in describing the picture is a form of total seeing understanding. So where did all this begin for computers? Clearly not 540 million years ago. It began actually in the summer of 1966, in the steamy summer in Boston, in, uh, in MIT. At that time, the field of artificial intelligence was born, it was very nascent, but there was a lot of excitement for artificial intelligence. So one professor at MIT decided that um, in one summer, we're going to solve the problem of vision. Because vision feels easy. You open your eyes, you see. You don't need to think about how you see. So he, he thinks that with these powerful computers they had in 1960s, this summer vision project will solve vision. And in fact, that's what the charter is. The summer vision project is an attempt to use our summer workers effectively in the construction of a significant part of a visual system. Well, 60s, 
60 years or, or 50 years have passed, we haven't really solved vision yet. The field that seeded with a few undergrads and one ambitious professor now became a field of thousands of researchers and uh, professors and industry, uh, innovators worldwide. Um, but it did begin uh, 50 years ago. And there were some early attempts in order to understand the total scene, the story of the scene. For example, um, Larry Roberts, uh, his PhD dissertation at MIT was probably consider the very first PhD thesis in computer vision, uh, try to simplify the world using blocks and, and try to describe the world in these kind of blocky shapes. Similarly, on the West Coast, um, um, in Stanford, on Stanford campus, Professor Tom Binford and his colleagues try to describe objects in this kind of geometric elastic uh, shapes called generalized cylinders. So these are the very early attempts of describing the world, describing the visual world, and describing the um, um, the, 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 the objects. But it didn't go that far. They were pretty schematic and uh, it didn't really solve any real world vision problem. And uh, why is it so? Why did the MIT professor think it takes a summer, but it turned out it was much harder than what it is? Well, the fundamental problem of vision is the following. What we see of the pixels on our retina or in the camera doesn't mean we understand the actual 3D scene. So for those of you who have a mathematical background, vision is a mathematically ill-posed problem. We have to reconstruct a 3D scene from 2D imagery, and that is fundamentally a, a ill-posed problem. And that's why it's so hard. This visual illusion illustrated, right? Now, you know this is an illusion. You know and I know these two monsters are digital copies of each other. Yet your brain doesn't reconstruct the scene this way. Your brain tells you it's a big monster chasing after a small monster, and then the big monster looks pretty scary, and the small, small monster looks scared. It's because there was enough computation going on in your brain that reconstructed the most plausible 3D scene based on these 2D imageries. So vision is beyond just measuring pixels. Here is another of my favorite example from the Renaissance artists. Well, this painting, every single pixel on this painting had nothing to do with a human. It's about vegetables, flowers, and fruits. Yet, we all see a person. We not only see a person, we see his gender, his face shape, his age, his expression, his, a lot of things about him. And that's because your brain has done more computation than just measuring the colors and intensities of these pixels. Otherwise, you wouldn't have reconstructed a holistic scene that made sense to you. In fact, of course, Plato understood this more than 2,000 years ago. Plato described the problem of vision as the problem of the prisoners of the allegory of the cave. He said that vision is fundamentally about reconstructing or reinterpreting what you see. As if you were prisoners tied on the chair, chairs, and you're forced to look ahead on a blank wall in front of you. And the wall is projecting shadows of a play in the back of the prisoner's head. So the prisoners are, are forced to only look at the 2D projection of the 3D play in the back of their head. And their job is to reconstruct what's happening in the back of their head. And that is what vision is like for all of us. And that's the problem we need to solve. So how do we solve this problem? How did nature do it? And how are we, so in the early years we saw people try to construct this by, by um, 
by just putting, you know, simplifying this problem with these blocks and geometric shapes, and it didn't go very far. Well, this is a very inspiring experiment coming out of developmental psychology and vision um, in, in, in biology labs. It's the Blackmore Cooper experiment on kittens. And this experiment shed light on a very, very important um, um, important aspect of intelligence. So what the setup is the following. When the kittens were born, let's say this kitten, when she was born, she was placed into an environment that only has horizontal structure. So this kitten spends the first few weeks of her life only seeing horizontal structures. There's no vertical lines, in other words. Well now, I'm gonna show you a video that shows after a few weeks how the kitten reacts to first horizontal lines, which she's familiar with, and then vertical lines, and see how the kitten reacts. So she's placed here, and there's horizontal lines. And being a kitten, she is very intrigued by this little moving horizontal line, and she's following it, and she's trying to grab it. And that's just typical kitten behavior if you have a kitten at home. Um, well, now we're going to show her vertical lines. You see, she doesn't even see it. Her visual system, because it never learned the vertical structure of the world, did not develop any receptive, what we call the neurons or receptive field is never tuned, it didn't develop anything to see vertical lines. So this is a very remarkable experiment. I'm not so, so sure we can, we can uh, people, uh, scientists are allowed to do this experiment in, in, in this day and age. <laughs> But this remarkable experiment underscored one very, very important aspect of intelligence, is the ability to learn. It's really, learning is the most critical part of um, high animal and human intelligence. And this is what um, we need to enable computers to do. So on this quest for visual intelligence, the first message we learned is that learning is the path to visual intelligence. And this is what happened um, around after 30 years of trials and attempts and, and some breakthroughs in computer vision. Around the year 2000, our field uh, had a major, major change of heart, so to say, is that it realized that computer vision need to marry the sister field of machine learning, and today some of you know this through deep learning, but, but it was called machine learning, and, uh, and come together to really build intelligent machines. So you, you look at this calendar and say 2000, what's special of year 2000, right? Well, it was turning of the millennium. But there is something very special of the year around 2000. It's because for the 15 to 10 years leading up to the year 2000, the field of machine learning has made huge progresses that lay the foundation of everything we do and we see today. So for those of you who come from the computer background and especially with a little bit of machine learning background, you know that some of the key techniques, support vector machines, boosting, graphical models, Monte Carlo sampling, variational, uh, variational uh, inference, mark of random fields, as well as today what we know as deep learning neural network were all invented for the, the for the t t uh, during the 10 to 15 years leading up to year 2000. So it was a really, really important historical era. Uh, coming from a outsider perspective, you probably don't know, um, you, you probably see an explosion of AI today, but really as an AI researcher, what I see was that the explosion happened about 10, 20 years ago inside our field, and today what we're seeing is the transfer to the to the real world. So, um, 
So with this powerful tool called machine learning, computer vision is starting to tackle some of the most important and fundamental problems. And one of the most important and fundamental problems in vision is object recognition. If you go back to what humans see in a scene, the building blocks are objects. If we don't see objects, it's very hard to, to do the total scene understanding. Um, so, well, the first sub go is object recognition. I'm going to speak a little faster because I see I don't have much time left. Um, is uh, object recognition in the early days of machine learning is kind of um, uh, is kind of set up in a way that we use computers to find features and then use a uh, machine learning algorithm to classify objects. And we made a lot of progress using this traditional pipeline, which will be later replaced by deep learning. And uh, I'm just going to skip this uh, uh, slide. This is one of the biggest progress during that period of time, uh, defined by a seminal paper uh, authored by Viola Jones in around 2000, is using a machine learning technique called Ada Boosting to do real world face detection. And uh, five years after this very paper, Fuji camera, Fuji film rolled out the first digital camera in human civilization that does real world face detection. It was a direct transfer from the contribution of scientists in our field to the, the technology world. Today, no matter if you're using smartphones or digital cameras, it's just a given that we're taking for granted there is a face detector. But it happened, it literally happened 15 years ago with this paper and five years later, 2006, it was rolled out in, in products. Um, so in addition to, to um, um, recognizing faces, which is a little special, uh, there is another branch of object recognition that's going after generic object recognition. Things like cats, chairs, cars, dogs, um, and all this. Uh, how was this done? Well, for a while, uh, computer vision scientists are designing models that can define objects. Designing models with geometric shapes, very similar to what we did 30 years ago, but a little bit better because we design these models with geometric shapes, but we, we're trying to at least learn these, the, the learn a little bit using machine learning technique of how these shapes are, 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 um, are put together. For example, this is one way to configure these shapes. Well, you can, you can configure this cat with that, so you have to turn it around using another configuration. And then, you know, objects vary a lot. The same object viewed under different lighting, different viewpoint, and different gesture will have different shapes. So it was getting a little nuts. Even though we know we need to use machine learning tools, but we don't have a good grasp how to really account for these literally infinite number of variations due to all kind of changes. So the field staggered for a while. For about 10 years, we were just exploring little incremental steps and didn't go very far. And then around eight years ago, 2007, I was a young assistant professor at Princeton at that time. And I was actually walking around one day thinking, what's wrong with this object recognition models we're building? And then one very simple observation hit me. It's about children's learning. You know, in early years of development, children learn a lot. And they learn by experiencing. They don't learn, they don't learn a cat by the mom or the dad saying the cat is a configuration of an ellipse and triangles. That would be ridiculous. So um, they just learn by looking at the world and experiencing this world. In fact, if you think the children's eyes are a pair of biological cameras, they take about five pictures per minute depend, uh, because of the movement of the eyes. And uh, by age three, they've taken about hundreds of millions of pictures. And that's the quantity 
that children or, or humans use to learn in the early years. Whereas at the field of computer vision, the whole field worldwide was playing with a few hundred images, and that just didn't cut it. So once we realized this, my colleague, my colleagues, and I um, realized that. Um, learning requires big data. We not only have to marry learning into artificial intelligence, we have to marry big data into this. So, um, and it was also a historically very interesting time. While we as scientists realize big data is important, the world is exploding with data. Internet exploded. And because of internet, the amount of data exploded. The first 10 years of the new century, 21st century, we saw the explosion, exponential explosion of data. And more importantly, um, here's a graph showing you what happened on the internet in every 60 seconds. Most of these data are in the form of multimedia between videos and and pictures. So we've got a lot of data out there, and we can leverage on that. Therefore, um, my colleague and I, Professor Kylie, and my, at that time he was my student, but now he's a professor, Jia Den, um, started this ImageNet project. The goal of ImageNet project is to give the world of AI research the kind of data that children experience in their early developmental years. In in order to jump, to really reboot the, the, the research in computer, computer vision and object recognition. So we went on the internet, we, we got billions of images from, the, from the, the internet, and we asked for the help of almost 50,000 online workers uh, across 167 countries using the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform to help us to clean, sort, label, uh, index all of the images we downloaded. And re the result was this ImageNet data set that has eventually has 15 million images organized in 22,000 categories uh, according to everyday English vocabulary. And then we made this available to the uh, completely for free publicly to the entire worldwide community for, for computer vision and, and machine learning research. So that was a huge big data effort that our field needed in order to jumpstart the real um, work in uh, tackling some of the hardest computer vision problems. And um, this is just a comparison to show the size of the uh, image that data set dwarfs everything else that the field was using prior to that. And, um, and uh, while we, uh, after we put together the ImageNet data set, we also, Stanford hosted an annual international visual recognition challenge. And uh, that was the ImageNet uh, uh, challenge to invite worldwide researchers to uh, benchmark their algorithm's ability to recognize objects. Um, and uh, as you can see, the error rate steadily decreases starting 2010. But there was a special year, and that special year is 2012. In that year, the error rate had a huge jump, uh, decrease. And uh, what happened? Well, deep learning happened. Specifically, the paper by Alex Krzyzewski and his advisor Jeff Hinton called ImageNet Classification, the Deep Convolutional Neural Network Framework, um, won that year's um, uh, ImageNet Challenge. And that was the, what people quote today, the historical moment of the deep learning revolution or renaissance. So um, a little bit of a historical note. Um, convolutional neural network is not new. 
and was not new at, uh, in 2012. It was developed by a whole group of scientists led by Yang LeCun and many others uh, back in the 80s and 90s. And if you look at the model that Alex Kruszewski and Jeff Hinton used uh, uh, 14 years later in 2012, it didn't differ much from the original model. There was a tiny bit of difference that I'm not going to get into today, but the mass, the equations remain the same. So what changed in that 14-year period? I think it's really important to appreciate two important changes in the world of computing. One change is goes with the Moore's law, is the hardware change. If you look at the, 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 the size of the memory, the speed of computing and all this, um, we have better and better chips, especially NVIDIA's GPU. And that enabled high throughput parallel computing that enabled us to train these humongous models. Another change is big data. Because of ImageNet, the amount of data that's available for these big high capacity models was able to enable the, the kind of machine learning we needed to happen. In a more mathematical um, sense, big data helps to combat overfitting issue uh, in machine learning. So the convergence of a, a high fidelity model called the convolutional neural network model with hardware with big data enable the explosion of the deep learning success we see in computer vision. And uh, so I'm going to really skip, I don't know what happened, uh, there's only 40 seconds left. <laughs> So I'm going to skip a huge chunk of, um, of um, detecting uh, more objects and jump to another important sub-goal that we were talking about earlier using the human experiment is object recognition took a huge jump or a leap forward because of ImageNet and uh, deep learning. But the next goal towards our holy grail total scene understanding is really to tell the story of a scene. And to tell a story is just like people writing sentences. What we want to do is to show the computer a picture and ask the computer to generate a sentence like this, right? A dog jumping over a hurdle. Well, the computer doesn't see a dog. The computer sees all these numbers. So it's actually quite a challenge to get from these numbers into a human-like synthesis. So what we really did is we have to design a model that can first represent images and then generate sentences. It's a two-step model. And how do we represent images? We use the convolutional neural network we just saw before. And it actually, this is a little bit of an internal uh, doing of the con uh, con convolutional neural network. It kind of breaks the image down into patches and pieces and, and, and then describe it in a, in, a, in a sensible way. And then the next part is a language model, what it's called recurrent neural network model. It's a sequential model because language is sequential. And this model will generate word by word in a sentence that makes sense like the cat sat on a mat. And I'm not going to get into this. But in any case, putting these two models together, we're able to sh uh, produce uh, my lab and concurrently with a few other labs at Google and Microsoft, was able to produce one of the very first system in the world that can s see a picture and speak human language. And uh, um, let me just jump to the... Um, final model without showing you. So for example, taking this picture, the model would say a girl in pink dress is jumping in the air. 
And uh, keep in mind, there's no human involved. This is all computer generated. Here's another computer generated sentence. A construction worker in orange safety vest is working on a road. I was very impressed when I saw this, when my students showed me our, how our algorithm did it. And um, a man in black shirt is playing guitar. The system is, uh, um, is not perfect. It, it will make mistakes here. The beach volleyball was mistaken for a hurdle, but you know, you can kind of see the structure of a hurdle. Um, this one is even funnier. <laughs> The computer doesn't have a good context, therefore it just thinks anything. In the training time, it saw enough baseball bat, it thought that toothbrush looked like a baseball bat. This one is a little, I don't know what the computer is thinking. <laughs> I'm not going to psychoanalyze <laughs> the algorithm. It, it gets a little freaky. But, uh, but, um, but that, was, that was a very first step that we started to see computers thinking like a human. And um, uh, these are just numbers. And recently, we've taken this step further. And instead of generating one simple sentence, we wanted to generate multiple sentences in a scene. And I'm not going to get into um, the details of this, but what we call this is dense captioning. It's not captioning one sentence, it's captioning multiple. And again, we do this in the deep learning framework, but here, in order, in between the convolutional neural network and the recurrent neural network, we have to add a localization layer that, that finds by itself interesting parts of an image and generate sentences on that image. Uh, on that part instead of just the whole image. And here is an example. Given this image, our algorithm generates, finds this interesting part and call it man riding on an elephant. But it also finds another part saying two people sitting on a bench. And find another part, this is a trunk of an elephant. Another part is a head of elephant. It's a leg of an elephant. There's tree trunks and tree trunks. You can see it's starting to describe different parts of the scene. And then uh, um, here's another example. Um, again, uh, given a scene, the, the algorithm is giving a more detailed interpretation of what's going on, again, towards that total scene understanding. Um, and one benefit of doing this is that we can start to find very small objects that are really hard to see in the original um, object recognition algorithm. For example, head of a giraffe, which is really small. But because of the storytelling algorithm, it's capable of seeing that. Or tennis shoes or phones. So these are the very impressive results that came out of this deep learning architecture for image understanding. Um, I'm going to skip this. So I've shared with you very quickly what we did towards the goal of total scene understanding in pictures. But the same thing is starting to happen in videos as well. So I'll just show you a couple of examples and then wrap up this uh, talk. So a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we collaborated with Google's YouTube and put together a 1 million um, sport video data set and used deep learning neural network algorithm to classify YouTube videos according to the sports type. So in this video, you'll see the algorithm is predicting what type of sport it is. And the upper left corner, the first row, is the highest scored sport. And keep in mind, there are 450 types of sports the computer could choose from. So a chance level would be 1 over 450. That, that would be very, very small. But here, the computer is doing quite a remarkable job of what the sport is. And this is, uh, this is the first time that we can look into the videos of YouTube and see the content without relying on only on the, on the textual data around it. Um, 
here, here's another example of um, putting together videos and then being able to cluster videos of different events like flash mob events or um, birthday events or um, here I think there's another example or fishing events and so on. So this is not easy because all these events look very different. We have to really understand what the humans are doing in order to cluster them and being able to uh, query them. Let me just, here's another um, work, uh, another um, collaboration with Google where we use a deep learning algorithm to track basketball players during the entire game and also to understand what they're doing. For example, on the right, you see a three-pointer success uh, shot. Not only the algorithm can track all of the players, it also can locate the person who has success successfully played that three-pointer um, shot. So this is another um, deep learn uh, application of deep learning uh, algorithm. I'm going to skip this. Um, uh, in this particular work, we're doing similar things, but by using a more advanced algorithm called deep learning reinforcement learning, we only need to use 2% of the frames to do what we just did before. Um, in this particular uh, application, we actually didn't use a regular camera. We used a uh, in, uh, infrared camera called Kinect. If you play Xbox, you know that. And we use that to estimate human gestures using the deep learning algorithm. And this will be, uh, we are applying this work in hospital settings where privacy is really important, but we still need to understand human movements. Here we can protect the privacy of the people, but also understand what's going on. Um, we not only can use uh, computer vision to track people, we can understand their social roles. So in this video, we're showing that the computer vision algorithm is automatically tracking each people, understanding it's a wedding event, and assign the social role of each people because of its their behaviors and, and, and so on. So, um, so, so, it, 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 sorry for the big rush, but we have taken a journey of more than 50 years together in the last 30 minutes and uh, had a very brief uh, introduction of how the field of computer vision and artificial intelligence has evolved through the incorporation of knowledge, data, and machine learning. So one would ask, have we solved computer vision? You've shown us very, very impressive result. And I would like to remind everybody, we have not solved computer vision. The journey is still long. And I want to use this last picture as an example to show you where we are and where we we, sh we should be going. So if you look at this picture, what can today's computer vision tell us? Today's computer vision can tell us their people. It can roughly tell us the gesture of the people. It can tell us the rough layout of the scene. There's like a ceiling, a floor, a wall, and so on. It can also give a caption, a group of people in a room. If you use our latest dense cap, it can also say, you know, there is, it can also find a few areas and give a caption. All this is fine. It gives you a good sense of what's going on in this room. But as people, we see a lot more. We see this. We see a picture, we recognize the people, we recognize the subtlety and the humor in this picture. We recognize the expression, we just, the whole experience that you have with this picture is a lot richer than what the computer is capable of giving you. And this is where computer vision is going. We're going after deeper and deeper understanding of the scene, of its 
uh, actors of the intention of the purpose of the emotion of the of the activities and everything around it in order to give more and more uh, more and more um, um, deeper um, uh, intelligence to our machines and uh, with that kind of technology I'm personally very very excited by computer vision because computer vision technology can help the blind can help the can help massive you know sustainability sustainability issues can help safety and surveillance can help healthcare in in in, that, in other words um, 500 million years ago vision give animal world the Cambrian explosion. Well, I think that 500 million years later, computer vision will also be the enabling technology to give us, to bring us a techno technological Cambrian explosion. And uh, we're not too far from that day. So these are the students who helped me to do some of these uh, work that we have just seen. And uh, thank you very much.